Uh, let me make a very short introduction into our next subject, and I will be very brief. Um, so we, in this uh, section, we like to discuss intellectual property rights-related issues. Um, and uh, we will have uh, Katharine Troutman making the introductory remarks. I, I will just say very few um, um, uh, topics and just setting the scene. And um, Mark Barreca will follow and will make some remarks from the, uh, from the US side. So what is, uh, I think it's uh, important to, to keep in mind, um, and this is the background, the setting. Um, our companies, all of our companies in Europe and in the United States and globally, most of them um, are companies which uh, actually have a very intensive integrated transatlantic market. Um, and most of them actually are um, uh, definitely the global operating companies, independent, you know, which sector they are coming from, media sector or the search engine or the social media or all of the other companies are global companies as well. So it is very important, um, of course, to understand that the uh, intellectual property framework, where it is coming from, was very much nationally driven. But in a digital environment, it's not always easy uh, to handle, um, you know, the um, to handle the item in the same way like we have done in the past. Uh, the digital environment is, of course, a challenge in many ways for certain sectors, um, and uh, we we've, that's the um, that's the the issue actually we face uh, right now. So when you look at uh, what is going on in the uh, European Union, in the European Union, the, the situation is even a little bit more complicated. Uh, Pila mentioned it very briefly in her uh, introduction remarks on privacy because um, we do have, of course, an, an European oversight and in many ways European uh, legislation which are driving the issue. Nonetheless, um, in, in many areas and in, on, with regard to many topics, uh, member states um, uh, are still responsible in certain areas and the national law is applicable. And that's very important to keep in mind, um, and the situation differs uh, with regard uh, to this situation to the United States. That's one of the reasons um, why the European Commission um, actually is looking into uh, and, and setting an, an, a new idea, a new framework, what is called the single market for intellectual property rights, and it continues with the slogan, boosting creativity and innovation. It's a very long title. I will not bother you with the title, but the basic idea is really um, to understand uh, and to set a framework for intellectual property rights in the European Union right, right in the sense that it is as European as much as possible, uh, right in the sense that it reflects the international need uh, for the companies and even for many citizens operating. Uh, and it uh, will be in certain areas, it will continue to respect um, national frameworks. Now that's a very challenging approach. And of course, because of this very challenging approach, we see clashes, which are natural clashes, because we are in a phase of transition in the digital environment. We see natural clashes, and I have seen them 15 years when I was in the parliament, between the various operators, because it's, um, it is different if it's a search engine which is looking into intellectual property rights related issue or telecom or an ISP provider which shall suddenly carry liability related issues which they have never done in the past or uh, a Time Warner, we have uh, Claudia Mori here from Time Warner or, um, you know, you name them, name them all. I mean, you, you know this world as much as I do. Um, but for the European Union, it's a cornerstone uh, to get the issue right. Now, what are the, the um, uh, what are the, some of the important issues? It's cross-border problematic. I mentioned it, so the cross-border problematic will continue. But I think the Commission, and more particular, I'm very hopeful that the European Parliament will uh, will get this right as much as they can, and as much as the power allows all operators uh, to set a new framework. Um, going beyond uh, national possibilities. I would recommend to you to look into two uh, documents which are highly interesting with regard to this to understand the discussion in the European Union. One is the uh, Hargreaves report uh, done in the United Kingdom, which really the, the report is out um, and, and I really recommend you to, to read it because the, the conclusion is uh, from the UK government that um, the IP environment which we see right now and everything which relates to the intellectual property rights environment is not fit for the digital age. 
Ireland is doing a, um, is right now in the, in the process of consul, uh, doing their consultation, very similar to what the UK has done. Um, and the consultation, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, will, um, will be concluded today. Um, one item which relates to this, it's the, uh, the so-called update of the um, uh, Enforcement Directive on Intellectual Property Rights. Um, I leave all of the, the, the points to, to Katarine Trautmann to say more in detail about it. And one final point, which is the, the balance, to get a balance right between strong intellectual property rights and uh, the uh, so-called fair use doctrine, or what we call in Europe the um, exception and limitations. Uh, what we see from the United States, and we discussed this in, uh, intensively, and the discussion which will um, come over to Europe very soon is the Protect IP uh, discussion in the Senate, and what we heard yesterday uh, from Goodlatte um, that it will be debated similar a similar approach um, in the Congress. Uh, now we do have some uh, concern. Again, I'm I'm uh, I'm just refer to Katarina Trautmann, who will look into this um, issue. You need to keep in mind that the background um, of our operation between the European Parliament and and the the Congress is the um, uh, to some degree in this area not always very well defined yet. Uh, it's the Transatlantic Economic Council. Some areas, some of the issues which we discuss here are already moved to the Transatlantic Econ Economic Council, but not all of the topics are part of this. And the European Parliament uh, colleagues, like, um, like from the US uh, delegation, are actually an, an intensive part of this uh, dialogue, which is more government driven. Nonetheless, it has a very intensive uh, legislative uh, component, which will be in the future even stronger. With this, Katarine, uh, please. Thank you, uh, Erika. Um, I just uh, want to uh, uh, give you um, an overview of uh, the key moment in which we are uh, in, uh, in uh, European Union. Uh, why? Because we are very much touched by, uh, by the crisis, the financial crisis, and it's very difficult to uh, find new growth and to support uh, the creation of jobs. So uh, we think that one of our biggest and important tool is really the unique market. So what we can do is to take initiatives to simplify and to give a good framework for intellectual property, because of course intellectual property uh, gives, uh, you know, uh, the basement uh, for uh, the um, uh, the capacity to have new uh, products, to have new processes, and to answer correctly to uh, the uh, challenge of uh, digital uh, economy. So uh, the Commission has adopted uh, for that a comprehensive strategy to revamp the legal framework in which IPR uh, operate. So uh, you will see that there are, um, you know, it's an extensive, um, you know, proposal. We have several steps. And I want to uh, uh, propose to uh, go through uh, this overview with three dimensions. First. Uh, what we can do uh, for the unique market and the importance of, of uh, uh, intellectual property. Second, uh, as we said, Diablo is in details and how copyright uh, can, uh, uh, the reform on copyright can succeed or not. And third, uh, what are the international consequences of this? First, uh, the IPR. Um, the, in the proposals of reform, uh, there is one uh, very key issue, which is a unitary patent protection. And of course, this is very important because it was an occasion of division between the member states. Uh, and uh, we have now a solution to have this unique European patent, uh, which is the reinforced cooperation between uh, uh, a majority of uh, member states who decided to work together and to uh, go through uh, the question of uh, linguistic uh, linguistic exigence. So we, they decided, and we supported it in the European Parliament, uh, to work on the definition of this new patent with the reference to the Munich office with the three languages which are used in Munich, that is German, English, French. So it was uh, the, you know, uh, some uh, member states were angry as Italy and Spain, but they didn't want to enter uh, the reinforced cooperation. But this is going on. Uh, 
The second aspect is uh, the creation, which is now uh, in discussion, of uh, a jurisdiction for this European patent. This will be very important to diminish the costs and to have a real stability uh, in the uh, case law and in the judgments uh, about uh, litigation. So uh, we hope that this will create a legal certainty uh, with this uh, new uh, court. <coughs> Third, uh, we have on the, on the table the modernization of the trademark system in Europe. This is less controversial. There is no question the question of language was uh, solved 15 years before, and uh, now it's just a modernization of uh, this uh, trademark system. So uh, I have uh, no uh, specific remarks to, 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 to express about that. The Commission intends to present proposal this year still uh, to modernize uh, the trademark system. And of course, it's also uh, a necessity to adapt this system to internet era. And we will look uh, on the uh, you know, transborder, uh, transatlantic uh, also issue. Uh, we have uh, next the creation of uh, a comprehensive framework for copyright in the digital uh, single market. This is more uh, difficult. So where are we now? We uh, convince that we need to write a new uh, copyright uh, system. We agree on the fact that uh, copyright is necessary Copyright is the way to give, uh, you know, the economical counterpart for a creation. And we need to find new business models and to help the capacity to answer to this two-side, uh, you know, situation. We could live uh, uh, as a sort of uh, conflict, uh, the interests of the end users of internet and the interests of the companies and especially uh, cultural, uh, you know, industries, as music industry. The problem was that the conflict began with a false question. The false question was from the music companies. They said, we lose money. So we need to sanction piracy. And the consumer said, look, we don't have the correct proposals offer. So change it. The problem was also on a juridic point of view, and I work with many specialists in Europe. We didn't give a definition for what is piracy. Just counterfeiting a comportment with a big uh, downloading activity or a commercial intention that is to sell irregularly, illegally, some uh, cultural products, you know, distributed by uh, firms. So this was a very huge uh, discussion. And so the answer in France was the three strikes system. Sanction, cut the access to internet. Fortunately, because of, of our debate on the uh, regulation on telcos, we could say that internet access is a quasi fundamental law because you have your identity, you have your communications, you can have urgent uh, uh, emergency, you can have uh, education, formation, many things which are necessary and one action cannot cut you if you use internet of all the other activities. Fortunately, the Constitutional Court of France uh, was completely okay with the issues of the European Parliament. And they took uh, the conclusions and they censor the French law. I see in the uh, system of copyright alert in United States, a more uh, wise answer, that is with five, six announcements for the user, but with also uh, some uh, questions I want to, to raise uh, uh, because of this uh, uh, solution. This solution is was decided uh, between companies and um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, public uh, side and the legislator. But uh, I didn't see that the organizations of consumers could sign uh, this, uh, this alert uh, system. And I cannot see who is the independent reviewer when there is a problem. Um, 
I uh, see also that there is a right, which is a right not clearly, uh, uh, with not, uh, no clear definition, which is the right to scan from the owner's right uh, the network to see who is downloading illegally and who must be, uh, you know, uh, seen uh, on, the, on, the, on the web. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think that uh, some aspects are not totally uh, clear. But if I see the situation in Europe, it's the same. We have the three strikes law in France. Uh, the, uh, the independent uh, authority has a problem. During month and month, they had to, to, to see if uh, you, the tool, the technological tool to look on the, on the traffic uh, could be accepted or not through the French law. Imagine. So when they did this, you know, we had a, a, a legal commercial proposal, so we, the piracy diminished automatically. <laughs> so now uh, the activity is not so important. It is important, but it's not so important. But we have still, uh, you know, uh, some economical consequences, as in the U.S. and other countries, uh, by a real piracy, a real piracy that is an intention to uh, take off uh, from the, the legal market, uh, some products. So this is a reality. I don't want to say that there is no reality for that, you know. But we need to have uh, a real uh, vision and clear definition on what is uh, really uh, piracy. So UK uh, adopted a bill, an economy, digital economy bill. The Spain uh, got uh, the Cinde law, which was hugely uh, contested. So we are now uh, in, in this situation. This is still a difficulty between uh, member states uh, to have a real a common vision on the system of copyright. The solution proposed by the Commission is to work on the multi-territorial copyright licensing. And we just finished and, was, and we adopted uh, the conclusions of our work group, which uh, worked during two legislatures uh, about uh, the reform of copyright system. It was adopted on the 29th of June, so you can find it uh, if you want, uh, if it's interesting for you. So we think that uh, we must go to an efficient multi-territorial collective management of copyright, and we need also to have common rules on the transparent governance and revenue distribution. That's why this reform will include also the reform of the uh, organizations of um, gestion of rights, authors' rights. So this is uh, the orientation. We have also, uh, um, you know, a text on the um, orphan works, but this is not controversial because orphan works, you know, it's the capacity to put on the net uh, some works which are in the public domain. So this is a sort of simplification of the access. So no uh, question on that. Uh, now, on the international uh, aspect, um, because we had this question about uh, the situation of uh, the reference uh, to internet and access to internet as you know, a fundamental right, we can see that it changes uh, also the definition of uh, the commercial act. When before you bought a, a CD, a DVD, you know, a material, uh, a, a concrete object thing. But now it's the access which is uh, the possibility uh, to have, uh, you know, your preferred music. So this is quite different. So we have to see a second point which is very difficult, is the role of intermediaries. This is a key issue between United States and uh, European uh, Union. Why? About net neutrality, and I could listen uh, this uh, during these uh, exchanges in this dialogue of this year, that uh, in the United States, net neutrality is not the same issue for the Congress, for the House. They don't use the term. I understand. It's very controversial. <laughs> but the problem is that through net neutrality, we in the European Parliament, for example, we refuse the responsibility of ISPs. Why? Because ISPs can be just the arm of a system which is a system of observation comparable to the police. And this is an intrusion we cannot accept from the member states and the governments or a role of ISPs which cannot be 
uh, just uh, accepted. So I must uh, conclude. And I want just to uh, uh, make uh, the um, evocation of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Protect IP Act. Uh, this uh, initiative uh, perhaps is not, uh, will not, uh, you know, attain uh, a real decision in the uh, in the uh, in the House uh, here or in the Senate, but um, it's very uh, dangerous uh, for us because it's the capacity, of course, to intervene outside the borders of a, of, a, of a state if there is a controversial uh, uh, website. Uh, which can be considered as illegal in the first uh, member state, in the first state. So uh, the European Union is very anxious that, for example, the American uh, decision can be to, to close a website situated in one of our member states. So this could be assimilated to censorship, but censorship decided by a state with which we have some agreements. So we have not finished about the discussion on the international level. And this uh, uh, initiative of Protect IP Act is a sort of difficulty, even if it's not a bit provocative, in the moment in which the European Parliament must finish uh, the examination of ACTA and take the decision. And as you know, Mexico, the Senate of Mexico, decided to vote against. So it's a difficulty. We have to finish with this difficulty. But uh, I think if we can write the correct references in the reform of copyright, we would have a tremendous good situation for our common uh, vision of the market. Thank you so much, Katerin, uh, for this complete uh, overview. Let me give the floor to Maritio Scharke. And um, please, Maritia, if you. I just can remind us, we have, I'm really sorry for this, we have 20 minutes left because we really have to finish at 11 o'clock. I'm going to talk very quickly, so bear with me. Um, I do want to thank the chair, uh, the EIF and the Congressional Internet Caucus, and wanted to let you know that there's also an intergroup on new media within the European Parliament, which I founded, and if you want to have more information, uh, happy to share. Okay. <laughs> We're here in the context of the transatlantic relation, and uh, that is based on our shared values and history, and I want to uh, touch briefly upon how these shared values play out online. The session is about IPR, but I'll specifically focus on copyright in the context of the digitized era. And perhaps you can help me answer a few questions to start a debate. If we see that the fragmentation of the European digital market and sphere effectively buries its cultural content, while at the same time the words protection and enforcement are the most often mentioned in the recent communication of the European Commission, what does it mean for the chances of reform and harmonizing the system? Both US and EU-based companies know that the need for harmonization and the completion of Europe's digital market is vitally urgent today. Erica just mentioned uh, the report written by UK professor Hargreaves, which actually speaks of the dominance of so-called lobbynomics influencing the entire uh, IPR debate and the assessment of the scale and impact of piracy and the need to have scientifically objective facts as a basis for policy. The assessment of damages is leading uh, a lot of the debate instead of, for example, the potential and the opportunities of the digital era and the need to reform and the potential that that reform might bring about. Vested interests in relation to economic value uh, are changing and new players on the market are becoming more and more influential and I'm sure that these will impact policy. Now, does the fact that digitized, digitized content is divisible, produced and distributed almost free of cost, lead to new business opportunities? And does this mean that uh, the way in which we deal with counterfeit, so tangible goods, should be different from the way in which we deal with the sharing of digitized content? In order to allow for prices to go down, audiences to be reached, consumers to have more choice, etc., even if this means that intermediaries or middle players who have historically enjoyed monopolies on production, distribution and profit models lose out, uh, if they don't innovate. Should government work on reform 
if barriers of a legal nature stand in the way of competition, of artists reaching larger audiences, of allowing small and medium-sized enterprises and other new actors to enter the market. Could it be that the principles of copyright law that were developed uh, or that was developed in the time of the printing press still stand, but that we must rethink their organization and management in today's day and age? I believe that if we want to maintain these core principles of copyright, but also of competition, online and offline, we must reform. In a globalized world, we are stuck with law and policy making on the nation state level. Also, in a connected world, everything influences everything. But still, governments have to defend the human rights and fundamental freedoms of their citizens, which have been mentioned in this panel uh, for numerous examples. Proposals of self-regulation should be critically assessed from that perspective. Which powers are given to commercial and private actors and which uh, main responsibilities are still in the hands of governments? I would like to end with a confirmation of my firm belief in the shared values between the EU and the United States. And I sincerely hope that we are credible when we work together and jointly speak and that we can lead by example. The developments of the Protect IP Act, which Catherine Troutman has already mentioned, lead to serious concern. Intervention and the takedown of websites in other countries would be a game changer. It would make the US non-credible when a country such as Iran or China takes down websites such as Twitter, Facebook or Google because they might endanger national security, they might uh, spread content that's undesirable illegal or illegal in that context. So with what credibility can the US then speak out against other countries involved in such practices? I think it would be uh, a shame and the EU uh, would hate to lose the credibility of its partner in that way and would hope to work together with the US uh, on IPR issues and on the flourishing of our markets and uh, well-being of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Marija, please. Uh, so I'll try to be quick so that we get to the Q&A. Um, as I indicated in the privacy session, uh, under the Obama administration, we're, we're in a period of, of uh, um, ferment. We're in a, enjoying a, a period when policymakers within the administration are coming together uh, around tough challenges that have lingered for a while to figure out if there are new policy directions. And I would say that within the intellectual property realm, uh, that is true as well. Um, rather than go through a long list of, of um, how we are taking a fresh look at um, how we uh, enforce intellectual property rights and how we enable the digital economy, let me just point you to a few other references. Um, within the past month, um, we, we have released an, an update of the work of the Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator. So uh, starting with the Obama administration, we have a new role within the uh, U.S. government, uh, the IPEC, Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator. And uh, Victoria Espinel is the first holder of that office. A year ago, she released a strategy for improving uh, enforcement. And uh, just this path, past month, she issued uh, a summary of, of many activities that the administration has undertaken over the past year to improve enforcement. Um, uh, as we go about this work, uh, we, we recognize fully uh, that we are uh, seeking uh, in many respects to have it both ways. As we all know, for many years, uh, the, the conversation around intellectual property in a digital environment has been uh, portrayed as somewhat of a, di a dichotomy uh, that uh, uh, you e either have it one way or the other. You either have strong intellectual property enforcement or you have uh, 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 vigorous, uh, fruitful innovation in the uh, um, production of new application services and copying tools. And um, as in the privacy realm, uh, the administration's view is that uh, in some ways uh, we should cut through those dichotomies and, and recognize that there may be ways to have it both ways, that we want to sustain innovation and we do want to, um, uh, in a healthy way, protect intellectual property. And so how are we doing that? In some cases, new legislation is indeed necessary. Uh, and and uh, the Commerce Department in particular, uh, with the backing of the White House and others, has been very aggressive in pursuing uh, uh, patent reform. And we are very, very close to having, uh, for the first time in years, uh, an update to our, our patent law. Uh, we can get into that in the Q&A if people like. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, 
uh, there may be instances where where the copyright law uh, needs to be adjusted as well. And here we recognize that uh, the Protect IP Act is an important step. It's an it's an and it's an important step uh, put forward by Congress. Uh, I'll disappoint people in the audience by saying uh, up front here that there is no official administration view on on the details of of the Protect IP bill. Uh, but we do look forward to working with stakeholders uh, both here and overseas uh, as we. Uh, um, uh, bring our views together as an administration. Uh, but then also importantly, this is a space where uh, collectively, uh, both in the United States and overseas, we believe there ought to be promotion of multi-stakeholder driven solutions. So for example, within the past uh, week um, in the United States, the major internet service providers and the major uh, content companies did come together and announce a memorandum of understanding uh, under which uh, the two will col the two sectors will collaborate uh, to crack down on the most egregious uh, online pirates uh, that are uh, uh, ex exploiting their uh, broadband connections uh, to um, uh, 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 to commit um, uh, rampant acts of piracy. And that type of multi-stakeholder solution, we believe, ought to be encouraged because it gets at some of these nuances uh, that are very difficult, like in the privacy space. Uh, the the multi-stakeholder approach, we think, uh, can get at some of these nuances that we think are difficult to draft regulation and legislation around. Great. Thank, great. Thank you so much. Who would love to go ahead? Please, don't disappoint us. We are hurrying here. Please, the gentleman there. Good morning. My name is Chris Israel. I'm the uh, American Continental Group here in town. I think this is a tremendous conversation and certainly underscores the huge necessity in terms of sharing information and making sure that we're very well aware of the variety of proposals and approaches to addressing these important, particularly these important intellectual property issues. Uh, coming from our two very sizable markets that are very dependent upon our intellectual property industries to drive our economies forward. Um, it does, some of the comments I do think underscore that need for ongoing education and, and the continuing sharing of information, uh, particularly in regards to the Protect IP Act. Um, and I think it puts an onus, obviously, on the United States and those of, in congressional leadership who are uh, proposing that idea to share information with others in, the, in Europe and other countries because I think some of the characterizations of the Protect IP Act that were made this morning uh, fall a bit short of what some of the specifics of the proposal would actually do or seek to accomplish. They would come nowhere near, I think, uh, allowing the United States to seize foreign websites or intervene with foreign websites or activity that's going on in other countries. That certainly would not be something that this country could put, its, put itself in the place of doing. I do think uh, when you talk about the notion of allowing um, government ag agencies or private rights holders to seek a remedy in a U.S. court that allows them to work effectively with an intermediary like a payment processor or, or an ad service provider to uh, disallow or, or get in the way or interrupt the commercial activity of rogue websites that are blatantly interfering with and, and, and uh, infringing on intellectual property. That's a completely different conversation in and in a much more uh, a conversation I think that is that is very germane to to the dialogue between the United States and the U.S. So I think hopefully we can move beyond some of the misinterpretations of the Protect IP Act and what uh, what is actually trying to accomplish in a very targeted and specific way to attack what is a very big global problem, particularly for our two economies. Thank you for for the clarification from your point. I take uh, the gentleman here. I don't think so. There's Somebody wants to make a comment on this one. I think we continue, and then we I go back to the um, to the panel. Thank you, Thomas Peter with ICANN in um, based in Brussels. I just want to make one point that is actually relevant, I believe, for the U.S. and the EU as well. And I, I, I come before ICANN. I come from the private sector, so I understand what IP is. I understand the risk and the benefits as well. I, I just want to say that uh, when policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic discuss about your initiative and, and, and the one in the parliament as well, please also keep in mind the, the overall stability of the internet 
and the overall need for you know because we, there is a global audience obviously and if you start to you know here and there take down on have other type of similar measures this will have an impact on the way the the, the global internet is governed because other countries as Catherine mentioned uh, are, are looking at, at that as well so it's uh, there is not only a EU or US impact this will have a more global uh, um, effect as well thank you Thank you, Thomas. The concern, um, I put on my icon hat, um, the, the concern is here that uh, because p the Protect IP covers some language that a .com and a .net, everything which relates, all the companies uh, which relate to it globally will automatically fall under US jurisdiction. This can have some kind of uh, extraterritorial effect. Now, it might be all misinterpreted, and we are very early stage of reviewing this, and uh, I think we have taken um, your point, but I think the most important is to stay in discussion. Uh, to stay in discussion because we, for Mike, and we received the, the white paper which was um, delivered by a team of engineers which really looked at it and said, hey, be very careful. Whatever you do, don't you know actually get it wrong with the internet route. Um, so it's just an, an, a plea to work together and, and, and uh, to get it really right, whatever we do. Uh, yes, thank you. My name is Justin Serafini from Height Analytics. I, I thought some of the discussion on responsibilities for intermediaries was very dis interesting. Two questions I have is about um, revisiting some of the versions of safe harbors for intermediaries uh, as far as our responsibilities toward uh, content holders. Uh, I mean, the eBay decision recently in the European Court of Justice was very interesting. We still also see the YouTube uh, Viacom lawsuit being appealed. I'm just kind of curious if there's any discussion about whether or not any of the policy there needs to be revisited. So um, this, the, the role of intermediaries, it's what's, what I love about this space is all these issues concatenate together, right? They, you move from privacy into security, you move into copyright, you move into the role of intermediaries, and, and um, you, you, ha you can both talk about policy in a specific space, but you can't ignore you know, the related spaces. Um, what I would recommend to you in terms of understanding what I think is a, a, f uh, a pretty good articulation of the common view uh, as between the United States and the EU and, and um, uh, with other developed countries, in fact, is, is the recent uh, statement of Internet policymaking principles issued by the OECD. Uh, you know, I, I, coming back to my, my theme here, you know, I do believe that we are in a period of ferment around, around Internet policymaking, and, and that OECD statement is another manifestation of this, this period that we're enjoying. And in that is... A, I'll grant you a high-level statement about the, the important role that intermediaries play uh, and the Im importance of making sure that uh, intermediaries uh, continue to play that important role be by, by virtue of not being saddled with uh, excessive uh, liability or threats of liability. So, you know, I, I would point that out as sort of an overarching uh, statement of principle shared um, among uh, developed countries. Um, then, however, you have to get into uh, the nuances of individual circumstances, and, and you know as well as I do that sometimes those play out uh, in the courts, sometimes they play out in regulatory proceedings, as I indicated. Uh, you know, they can also play out in a productive fashion when you have the stakeholders in a room talking about how they might wrestle chronic issues to the ground and, and working on, uh, you know, shared solutions. Thank you. I wanted to respond to the gentleman who, suggest, who suggested uh, more education on our side, and th I'm always happy uh, to be more educated. But um, as part of my education about this this bill, it strikes me that a hundred or more law professors have have voiced criticism and concern that it might be unconstitutional in the U.S. context. The bill quite literally aims, and I'm quoting, to deny access and linking to, quote, pirate or, quote, rogue websites, especially those registered outside the U.S., which are uh, dedicated to infringing activities. And then we also see that uh, a number of think tanks, but also companies such as Yahoo, eBay, American Express, Google, uh, or Reporters Without Borders, Human Rights Watch, are concerned. So 
that's just a little bit of context also in terms of the, diff the different players in this uh, field. Then on the OECD statement, I think we must, in light of this education and inclusion of, of players uh, at the table, reach out more broadly than we do perhaps. Uh, and uh, as policymakers, we should uh, certainly do that, but I would also uh, invite um, American counterparts and business actors to do so, because this OECD statement, which is presented by some as, a, as an inclusive and uh, valuable document, has been um, rejected by all civil society actors who are joined, or a major group of civil society actors uh, who participated in this meeting. And I think that's regrettable, <coughs> because then there is a split between uh, civil society actors, companies, and politicians who are trying to deal with uh, issues of shared concern online. So uh, somehow we must come to more inclusion, and also when we uh, we are dealing with laws that impact people in third countries, uh, while we are responsible for making decisions, I think we should also at least talk to people in those third countries to to assess the impact on the other side. If I if I could just make one comment on the OECD uh, statement of internet policy making principles, I wasn't there in Paris during the conversations, so I, I can't speak. Uh, from first-hand knowledge, but the reports I received back from my colleagues uh, from the U.S. government who were there and who did participate um, um, in, in the discussions uh, were disappointed in the end that certain uh, portions of the civil society uh, decided not to um, en endorse the document. Although I would, based on what I know, um, the, there were a substantial number of c civil society organizations that did endorse it. Uh, and and um, from what I understand, those that uh, expressed their dissatisfaction by refusing to endorse it uh, were uh, um, um, disagreeing, uh, expressing their disagreement with one section, in particular the intellectual property section. And so it's just indicative to me of how these dialogues tend to play out over the course of time and how much IP, frankly, can be a hot button issue, right? We see that here even. Um, it's, to me, it's unfortunate that this overarching effort to come up with a holistic menu of principles uh, for some um, wasn't, was, uh, was seen as uh, unsatisfying because of a particular element. You know, you know from my personal uh, perspective, it would have been nice to see a general endorsement followed by a caveat instead of, a, you know, sort of a, a walking out of the room uh, because... Uh, a certain provision wasn't formulated in a particular way to the, to the liking of certain elements of civil society. But that's the way these dialogues go sometimes. Yeah, that's, that's how life is. Um, <laughs> Ivalo, Calfin, you wanted to make a comment. Ivalo, I in introduced you already uh, at the very beginning, uh, although you couldn't come earlier. I know that you were in discussion. So please keep in mind, um, we're really running know, out of time know, because you want to go, you want to go no, to you New York. Go. I'm not going to go to New York, but uh, I'll keep it. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, just uh, just two comments on the, uh, to jump into the, into the discussion. Uh, first, uh, 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 definitely the uh, uh, internet uh, uh, service providers have to have their responsibility, but this has to be a responsibility for uh, assisting the law enforcement agencies. They cannot have a responsibility by themselves because uh, uh, let's think uh, we are not talking about IPR only. I mean, if we take all the issues of cybersecurity, that would mean to ask from the internet service providers to watch the whole content, to make decisions, to uh, limit access, to, 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 to interrupt uh, the use of internet. I mean, this is first technically not possible, second uh, absolutely not uh, based on any ground. So. Uh, whenever we uh, look, and I think uh, also that they need to have a role in the law enforcement, but this should be a subsidiary role uh, after the law enforcement agencies uh, start working, and then the internet providers have to uh, help to help on that. And the second thing is just a, a, a small example to, to show that sometimes it's really very, very difficult to uh, apply the uh, existing rules of uh, intellectual properties. Uh, I have produced a very short movie. I'm making a campaign in Bulgaria for uh, 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 easier recognition of diplomas uh, received in the European Union. Uh, I have made a, uh, produced a short uh, uh, animated movie, one and a half minutes. First, I tried like hell to find 
somebody to buy some music for this uh, to, to this movie. I spent quite a lot of time. At the end of the day, it happened that I have to pay again for one and a half meetings, few thousand dollars. Uh, uh, for the price of, uh, uh, of a piece of music. Originally it was Pink Floyd, then for Beethoven, Beethoven it was cheaper than that. Uh, but this is few thousand dollars for one and a half minutes. And you spent a uh, number of weeks searching how you can do that. So if we want to apply the intellectual property rights, uh, I really agree that education and availability and accessibility should be also there. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, with this statement, we come to an end. Um, what I would like to do, and please join me in, in thanking the speakers. Um, I think they did a great job. <laughs> and we are joined by James Ellis at the very end. James. James Ellis, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, co-founder of the Transatlantic Policy Network, uh, founder of the Transatlantic Policy N uh, Network and co-founder of the European Internet Foundation. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Tim Lauden and his team from the Congressional Internet Caucus. And I'd like to thank from the EIF, Christina Monti and Peter Linton. Well done, great job, and thank you so much. Have a great day.